All right, so I'm going to tell you some stories today about the queer history of the British Navy. Before I do that, though, I want to warn you that I'm going to talk about sexual abuse and about violence against queer people at a couple of points here. So please just be aware of that uh, as you listen and if you want to stay on the call. Sorry, let me move this too so it's not in your way. Okay, so this is mainly a story about one naval buggery scandal. There was a long series of scandals like this through the 18th and 19th centuries. They involved Navy men having sex with other men, or at least allegations that they had done that. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a likeness of the officer at the center of this scandal, but we do know a lot about him. His name was James Nehemiah Taylor, and he was the surgeon of HMS Jamaica. You can see the ship's plan for that ship here. So he was ship's doctor for about 150 or so sailors who served on that warship. At the time of the scandal, he was in his late 30s. Like a lot of Navy men in this era, he had gone to sea young as a teenager, and so he had served the majority of his life uh, fighting for the crown on ships like this one. The scandal around him erupted in 1809. So this is years into these long wars against France, first revolutionary and then Napoleonic France, uh, if you saw if you saw the new Napoleon movie, I was going to say, if you saw the new Napoleon movie, you'll know all about it. If you saw the new Napoleon movie, you won't know anything about it because the history is not very good in that movie. Um, if you saw it, you will know a lot about how Napoleon did in the bedroom, though. So uh, that movie has certain priorities about what it wants to tell you. Anyway, Taylor's scandal was the result of the British Navy's low-level policing of same-sex behavior in the fleet. Navy ships had a certain reputation in Britain, and the men in charge of the Navy, the top officers, the administrators, uh, the politicians, they were sure that sailors slept together regularly. In fact, uh, and this quote is an example of this, uh, if you look at people talking at the time, they often say that it's not only common, but it's on the rise. Same-sex relationships are becoming more and more common. This is something you can find throughout British history. If you look at people commenting on this, uh, you'll find this sort of alarmism. Sorry, I'm just trying to move this so it's not going to block things for you. Um, the people in charge in the Navy, though, the men who had power, mostly let this slide, and they rarely involved the Navy's dreaded courts, which were known as courts martial. One of the most mis one of the most common misconceptions that I encounter doing this history and talking about it is that Navy men were heavily policed for same sex behavior. So uh, let's take a minute and camp out on this because I want to talk about that a little bit before we go further. Now, any sexual contact between sailors was technically illegal, but trials for same-sex behavior were actually quite rare. I spent a long time, I spent probably too much time tracking down uh, evidence of every trial that I could find. And this graph shows the results of my work. The upper bounds on the x-axis here is 30, as you can see on the top left. So the Navy actually never tried more than 27 sailors for same-sex acts in a single year, and usually it was considerably fewer than that. They didn't hold a lot of these trials. There were long stretches, as you can see here, with no trials at all. And this really was a vanishingly small number of trials. At the high point, you see the spike um, off to the, the um, if you look at the center off to the right, the big spike there, um, that's the late 18th century and the early 19th century. That's the high point. At this period, the Navy is enormous. So you have a maximum of 27 trials in one year. In any given year at the height of the Napoleonic Wars, the Navy had more than 140,000 sailors enrolled in its books in a given year. So two dozen sodomy prosecutions in a community that large is essentially nothing. Buggery was in fact one of the least frequently tried crimes that was listed in the Articles of War. The Articles of War, the Navy's criminal code, they list out all the different offenses that you can be court-martialed for. This is one of the least frequently tried crimes. In this same period, these two centuries, when you have uh, several hundred buggery trials, a little more than 500, there were thousands of desertion trials. That was a crime that really concerned the authorities. They were desperate to keep the ships manned. Sex between sailors is not something that concerns them in the same way. Now, my and other historians research into lower level policing and punishments. So policing and punishment below the level of trials and courts martial shows that policing was rare there too. As I'll discuss in a couple of minutes, sailors usually tolerated sex, sexual relationships between sailors. They looked the other way, they ignored them. Maybe they gossiped and mocked, but they rarely did more than that. And only in very rare cases did they involve the authorities and bring allegations to trial. 
Um, I haven't listed it here, but you can find my sources and the raw data for this graph in my new book, which uh, Lucy mentions. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end today. So uh, you can find all the material for this there. The only thing that seems to have really bothered the authorities was abusive relationships between adult men and younger subordinates. These were usually ship's boys. Ship's boys served in large numbers at this time in the thousands. A tenth of a ship's crew might be young sailors uh, during this period. Now, sadly, it's clear from the records that these sorts of relationships were common and that they were mostly tolerated as well. This is really grim, but it's not too surprising. You find the same thing on land at the same time, most famously among domestic servants. A lot of people, a lot of uh, girls go into domestic service in this period. If you look at the records of rape, bastardy, and infanticide trials, which is something that I've done for other research that uh, I've conducted, you find that they're filled with servants saying that their masters had abused them. Unfortunately, much the same thing obviously happened in the Navy with ship's boys. The men who had power in the Navy don't seem to have cared about the young men and boys involved. This isn't about concern for their welfare. It seems instead to have been about abuse of power. That seems to have been what really concerned them. And so in rare instances, they sometimes made examples of men that they thought had abused their underlings in this way. The approach here was characteristic of criminal justice in this era. So this is how criminal justice works generally, uh, and not just in Britain, in other uh, ancien regime countries as well. A few people are punished publicly with extreme violence. So a violent public punishment, and they're supposed to serve as examples for the rest of the population. There's no effort to catch and punish everyone. Uh, there is not the state doesn't have policing powers like that that would even make that possible. So you're not trying to catch everyone who committed these crimes. Instead, you have a few striking examples, and everybody sees them get punished terribly, and that's supposed to inspire everyone else to do better, not to make the same mistakes they did. Now, most of those who became these examples were working class sailors. Most of the Navy was working class men and boys. They're just controlled at the top by a very small officer corps. The vast majority are working class sailors. Most of the policing of sexual behavior focuses on these common sailors. That's where uh, the Navy is focused when it polices sexuality. And as a rule, the authorities pick their examples from the laboring majority. So it's mostly working class adult male sailors. But sometimes an officer was foolish enough or unlucky enough to end up in a court. That's what happened to James Nehemiah Taylor in 1809, the guy at the center of our scandal. Taylor was a veteran surgeon and he hailed from a Navy medical family as well. His father had been dispenser at the Royal Naval Hospital at Hasler. You can see a view of it here. This was a respectable rank and he had pretty good social connections. Uh, surgeon is not a particularly uh, high rank. They're not particularly respectable, but uh, he's in the officer corps. Clearly wasn't enough to protect him when the higher ups decided to make an example of him though. So Taylor was put on trial for having sex with his servant, a ship's boy named Thomas Ashton. Officers were assigned servants as a perk of rank, and often boys did this work. Remember, there are large groups of ship's boys, uh, a lot of young sailors serving in the Navy. Often they do work as domestics, as servants for officers. Ashton's age is unclear. He was probably somewhere around 15 to 17. Different sources disagree, and a lot of people at this time didn't know their exact ages, uh, so it's not too surprising that there's some fuzziness here. The nature of the relationship between Taylor and Ashton also isn't clear. It was likely abusive. It was likely transactional. It's impossible for us to judge whether it was at all voluntary on Ashton's part, but that was a central question in this case. At this time, the male age of consent is just 14, and their ideas of consent were very different from ours. You can find trials, indeed, you can find Navy trials where the authorities thought that even younger boys had consented younger than 14. So different ideas of consent from ours or really different ideas of consent from some of ours today. When Ashton faced the court, he would have to prove that he hadn't consented, though. That was going to be important. Now, it's also hard for us to judge what really happened between the two, because in the end, Ashton actually wasn't put on trial. He wasn't given the opportunity. He wasn't forced to prove his innocence. He'd been locked up on the Jamaica. Remember, the Jamaica is their ship awaiting trial. But two months before the trial, he escaped from the ship. He made his way to shore somehow. Maybe he swam. Maybe he got a boat. And as far as I can tell, he was never heard from again, at least not by the Navy. He's able to disappear. There's a good chance that somebody engineered his escape, in fact. Fellow sailors, officers, maybe even the higher-ups. 
This was common in these cases. Navy men at all levels generally tried to avoid bringing buggery accusations to trial. One of their favorite methods for doing this was to just kick men off their ships or to let them escape. Captains actually sometimes admitted to doing this. You can find some, some really amazing examples from this period. Uh, one of my favorite sets comes from the diaries of Sir Graham Moore. You might have heard of Moore before. He ended up having a distinguished uh, career in this era. His diaries are really remarkable. They're, they're now in special collections at Cambridge University Libraries. And if you look at them, you'll find in a couple of places he writes frankly of instances in which he turned men off of his ship rather than bringing them to trial for having sex together. It's clear that this was some sort of standard, probably unwritten practice. Just a couple of years before the Taylor scandal, before the one we're focusing on, two lieutenants from HMS Barfleur uh, were put on trial for helping a fellow lieutenant escape from that ship. The allegations, and one of them was found guilty for this, was that they had helped him get out of his cabin window. He was under arrest in his cabin and get into a waiting boat that brought him to shore and let him escape. He had been put under arrest for sex with, and this is the term used in the, the charging documents, with several young men on that ship. So this practice of essentially administrative discharge for illegal sex was well known at the time. It was practiced frequently, and you can even find public discussion of it in the newspapers. The public was aware that this is how the Navy dealt with at least some of these cases. So let's go back to the Taylor case. When he faced the court, when he actually came to his trial, Several prosecution witnesses explained that they had seen him and his servant, Ashton, having sex together. They'd watched the two through a hole in the wall of Taylor's cabin. This was the standard story in these trials. This is actually uh, such a common story that it's a stereotype in the printed uh, crime reports. At the time, these were very popular. You could buy cheap uh, reports on um, criminal trials in cities like London. Um, uh, buggery cases were a popular one to include in these printed reports. Um, and uh, this becomes so stereotypical, you actually find people playing with the stereotype. Um, if you've ever read Fanny Hill, the, the classic pornographic novel from the 18th century, uh, the, the, the official title is Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure. There's a famous gay sex scene in that. And that sex scene is actually playing with this convention in the trial reporting. Fanny looks through a hole in the wall and sees two men having sex together. Um, so the next time you're reading Fanny Hill, I don't know if I'd recommend it necessarily, but the next time you're reading Fanny Hill, that might help uh, unlock that scene for you. At the trial, at Taylor's trial, when it came for his defense, when it came time for him to defend himself, he tried to counter all this testimony. He told the court that Ashton had suffered from boils, that the boy had had boils. Now, Taylor, of course, was the ship's surgeon, right? He's the doctor on the ship. And so he said he'd only been inspecting Ashton's body, seeing if he still had the boils. So he said what the witnesses had seen was medical care, not a sex crime. Now the officers trying him didn't buy this argument. They found him guilty and they sentenced him to death. Taylor tried several gambits to get this reversed, but all to no avail, he wasn't successful. A week and a half later, George III confirmed his death warrant and Taylor was executed by hanging on board the Jamaica on Christmas day, 1809. This was big news. A Navy officer put to death for sex with his servant and in the middle of a great naval war. And it made the papers throughout Britain. It even made some international news, in fact. Much of the coverage was extensive. A lot of papers give a lot of space to this. So I'll give you just one example here. This is from the London paper, The Globe, 13th December. So this is before the actual execution. They give 1,400 words in this single item. You can see the top, uh, the top of the two. Uh, the, um, the two columns that they devote to it, uh, they gave 1,400 words to the affair, including long excerpts of trial testimony. So this is just part of that. Okay, so, so far the story that I'm telling you fits many of the prevailing stereotypes about the queer history of the Navy. When we hear about that history, when we hear about it at all, especially from historians, people like me, it's often stories about crime and punishment, and that's mostly what I've been talking about. This has mostly been told as history from the gallows and the flogging grate. And I've got a depiction of the naval gallows here on the left and this famous Cruikshank image of a flogging, a naval flogging. So the flogging grate on the right. I call this the rum, sodomy, and the lash tradition. There's a longstanding and still very powerful view of life in the old Navy as one of rum, sodomy, and the lash. 
This is a line you may have heard before. Uh, it's most often attributed to Churchill, a joke that he supposedly made when he was first Lord of the Admiralty. Churchill was the political head of the Navy twice uh, during his political career. And supposedly he joked at some point during that, that the only traditions of the Royal Navy are rum, sodomy, and the lash. I should I should say, I, uh, I did not create these images. These are both... Um, these are both things that I found online. I'm not sure that any human being had a direct hand in them. I, I think uh, it's probably some program, some algorithm that um, uses these uh, databases of quotes you can find, famous quotes, and uh, created images for whatever reason from them. Um, the fact that this uh, this supposed Churchillism is in those databases, though, and that it's kind of echoing around in the culture on its own can tell us something. This clearly still has some currency. It's out there. People are still still telling this joke. Now, if you start looking, if you're activated to this, uh, you'll find rum sodomy in the lash in a lot of places. You'll find that actual phrase in a lot of places. One example that I like, this is uh, just about as old as me, so I feel a little kinship with it, um, is an album by the Celtic punk band, The Pogues, that uses the phrase as its title. You can see the, uh, you can see the album here. The cover art is uh, the Raft of the Medusa, right? That famous painting, but um, they've swapped in the band members' faces for some of the figures there. I should mention too, uh, Pogue is uh, is old American military and gay slang um, that has a range of uh, range of queer meanings. So uh, there was a lot going on with the Pogues. There, there was something they wanted to tell us clearly. Now the rum sodomy and the lash tradition suggests a naval past that was lurid debauched and grim, right? That lash piece at the end. Uh, the lash can be used for pleasure, but I suspect that uh, when people are telling this joke, they are referring to something different. So lurid, debauched, and grim. In different proportions, that's the queer naval history that we've tended to get. I could give you a lot of examples to show this. Let's look at one of my favorite ones. So let me jump here. So this is a still from a scene at the climax of a 2005 Channel 4 documentary called Naturally, Rum Sodomy and the Lash. That timing significant, 2005. It was produced for the bicentennial of the Battle of Trafalgar, Britain's greatest ever naval victory. This documentary takes up the task of showing what life was like in the Navy in the age of Nelson and Napoleon. It devotes a surprising amount of its runtime to topics like, and these are all quotes from the movie, butch women in disguise, transvestite lesbians, and you've got both women behaving like men and men behaving like women. Makes the Navy sound like a great time, doesn't it? Uh, but the story in the film is not all fun and games. It also includes a reenactment of a real buggery trial. The film climaxes with this scene in which two actors, and I've taken this image from it, two actors portray real men who are actually executed for sodomy in 1797. You watch in this scene as their feet twitch, their tongues bulge out, the camera hovers in slow-mo as they hang to death. And this is what we're used to with queer naval history. We've got a mixture in this film of furtiveness, stigma, titillation, and a good dose of pain. As an aside, and we've got a big group here, so you might be able to help me with this. I am desperate to track down a good version of this film. I've only had a YouTube rip. So if anyone out there knows how I could find that, or if anybody has an in at Channel 4 with the archives, please get in touch with me. Um, among other things, I really want to know if the um, the reggae soundtrack is actually from the film itself or if the YouTuber added that. Um, I, I need to know if it's real, um, and I would love to have a good version of this. Anyway, that's just an aside. Uh, this was a real trial that really did result in the execution of two sailors for what seems to have been, it's impossible to judge from the records, but it seems to have been a consensual sexual relationship. The men's names were John Benson and Philip Francis, two seamen from HMS St. George. This rum sodomy in the last tradition does reflect real and grim realities. The state did use terrible violence to punish some same-sex relationships, and sexual abuse does appear to have been widespread. Certainly the naval authorities themselves believed that it was. The James Nehemiah Taylor scandal, the one we're focusing on today, can certainly be told like these other stories. And that's basically what I've done for you. But this was a much odder and more unruly event. And if we look at it closer, we find a lot more than just abuse and punishment. It can also give us a window into a much broader and much richer queer history, 
And that can help teach us how to look past this preoccupation with rum, sodomy, and the lash. There's a lot more to find beyond that. A bind that you face looking at queer pasts, trying to figure out queer history, is that so many of our records come from policing and punishment. And as a result, so much of what we know is about stigma and violence. There's a lot that we miss as a result of that. This is a serious challenge, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. So what I want to do now is look more closely at the Taylor scandal with you to see what else it can teach us. What can we find beyond rum sodomy and the lash? Okay, so a couple of things. Let's start first with the fact that from the beginning, the Taylor case was actually a poor choice for one of the Admiralty's rare examples. They made a bad pick targeting him. And just to be clear uh, here on my terminology, when I talk about the Admiralty, the Admiralty is the branch of government that's in charge of the Navy. So when Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty, this is much later than, than the period we're discussing, but he was the political head of the Navy at that time. The Taylor case clearly caused discomfort at the Admiralty and among the public. As a rule, the higher ups were loath to execute officers for sex crimes. After uh, very extensive searching, I've only found nine cases ever of an officer being sentenced to death for buggery, and not all of those men were executed. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. In fact, it was generally very challenging to hang any man for sex with another man. The evidence that you needed to execute someone for buggery was very specific and detailed, and it was difficult to obtain. This wasn't a simple thing to get. Um, this is an unpleasant subject, so I will spare you the gritty details, uh, but I have published a paper about the forensics of buggery trials. So you can check that out. If that interests you, get in touch with me. I'd be happy to share it. It's, uh, in fact, uh, in an odd twist, it's an award-winning paper. So uh, I, uh, I, it's an odd thing to win an award for, but, but I am proud of that research. Taylor's prosecution hadn't met the minimum standard for a conviction. They hadn't established what they needed to, and Taylor and the Admiralty knew this. He petitioned for a reconsideration of his case, but the Admiralty wouldn't let the effort proceed. They blocked it right there. And there was no appeal system in place. There was no higher system of courts. So he had basically exhausted all of his options at that point. As a sidebar, and since we're on this image, I'll take a minute to just talk about this. This was actually also a problem in the case that was depicted in this documentary, the 1797 trial. In this case as well, these were working class sailors rather than an officer. But the prosecution also hadn't established what they needed to, to have them hanged. They did hang them, but there's a really interesting twist here. It's one that the movie doesn't go into. Uh, and this actually supports the argument that I'm making to you today, that we need to look more broadly and consider the full context and content of these cases. What happens after these two men were found guilty and sentenced to death is that their shipmates, the other men, at least some of the other men on the St. George, threatened to mutiny to free them. So they threatened to come into direct conflict with the officers to get these men so that they were not executed. This is a really surprising detail. This is not what we usually would expect of sailors. There's an assumption that there's very harsh stigma against same-sex relationships, but these men were willing to mutiny to save them. In the end, that's not what happened. The mutiny was crushed. The ringleaders were also punished and these two men were hanged. That's an accurate uh, piece of the depiction here. But if we tell that other part of the story, it really changes what that story seems to be about, or it can at least. Now, public reaction to the Taylor scandal, the one that we're focusing on, also showed discomfort. As I mentioned, this was a serious scandal and it made the papers all around Britain and even beyond its borders. Surprisingly, many of the items in the press actually painted a sympathetic picture of Taylor. So I'm gonna go through just some examples I think are particularly interesting here. And these are all from papers and journals in Britain. He was a man of great acquirements, according to one. Another praised his manners, quick flow of observations, and well-stored mind. One item that was printed in many papers, uh, papers at this time uh, often carry the same content. So uh, one item might be carried in several papers or even dozens of papers. So one that was printed in many papers described his strong education, natural abilities, and very extensive reading. Though it did also note, I didn't include this piece, but uh, this is very interesting. It note noted that he read some problematic authors, including the uh, the great enlightenment philosopher Voltaire. So uh, these are British papers, of course. They uh, they think uh, you, start, you start reading French writers, who knows what might uh, happen to you. Now, you may not expect this, but this was actually a common phenomenon in buggery scandals, uh, even ones in the early 19th century. And the early 19th century is often seen as a high point for anti-queer attitudes and violence in Britain. Even when men were found guilty, the men at the center of these scandals were often painted as praiseworthy in the press. So often you don't find the newspapers attacking them, quite the opposite, in fact. 
Even more important, the story that many readers encountered was far more complex than just one of crime and punishment. So Taylor tried to get free on the basis of his flawed conviction, like I was talking about a minute ago, but that fails. And then he tries another gambit. He tries for a pardon. This might seem like a long shot to us, but it actually wasn't at the time. Um, a lot of buggery convictions were overturned and the pardon was used for all sorts of crimes at this time. This was an important and very cherished royal power and a frequently used one. I haven't completed this research yet. I still need to figure, figure out the exact numbers, but in my initial research, I found that in the Navy, at least around one quarter of all death sentences for buggery were overturned. So a significant proportion of them. There were a number of ways to win a pardon, whether you're at sea or on land, and Taylor's method was a time-honored one, and this is one we recognize from our own time as well. What he did was he confessed his crimes and he found true religion, he converted. This process was clearly for public consumption. He made sure that the details got out. They made it into a lot of newspapers and the papers carried news of it extensively. So uh, he was doing this for people to see it. Different versions of what happened differ in some of the details, but they generally tell the same story. What I'm gonna do right now is summarize one of my favorite versions. This is a long account of what happened to Taylor spread across two issues of the Gospel Magazine, this venerable uh, evangelical magazine in the UK. I think the Gospel Magazine is still in print now, actually. Um, I'll need a fact check on that to be sure. But if that's the case, that's amazing. This uh, has been around for a long time. This is the masthead of the first of those two issues that carried the Taylor story. So what story did readers of the Gospel Magazine encounter? This is how it went. Supposedly, after the order for execution arrived, Taylor had a change of heart and experienced his religious conversion. Up until this point, he'd denied his guilt the whole time. He'd maintained that the crime hadn't been proved. He was correct about that. It hadn't been proved. Uh, it hadn't reached the legal standard. And he'd also maintained that he wasn't the sort of man who did these things. You often find buggery defendants saying exactly that. Now though, after he's been convicted and gotten his death sentence, he changes his tune. He admits that he desires men and that he seeks out male partners. He even tells his jailers and the public that he believed it was moral to do that. So now he rejects those earlier beliefs and he says it was wrong to get up to the queer things he had done. The papers informed the public that though he didn't seek a pardon, he would accept one if he was offered one, but only so that he could leave society, live in seclusion and spend all of his time performing repentance towards God. So he doesn't want a pardon, but he will take one if he gets it. In his attempt to sell his conversion, he says that he's willing to give details and even to name names. So what does he say? Well, he explains that there are communities of men who share an interest in other men. He admits that he'd even joined groups with those inclinations during his wide travels as a naval officer. He'd been with other groups of sodomites in the Mediterranean, in France, and even at the heart of the empire in London itself. Now, sailors, and especially naval officers, were some of the most geographically mobile people in British society at this time. They travel to all sorts of exotic places, they meet strange people, and a lot of people back in Britain fear that they're going to adopt foreigners' more unsavory practices. Same-sex desire is heavily coded at this time in Britain as a foreign infection. That's often the model that people use to describe it and explain uh, why certain people in Britain uh, engage in it. It's seen as a habit of the hated French, right? Uh, ancient enemies, the French, of Southern Europeans, Turks, and even more savage and less human peoples. So it's significant that Taylor named the Mediterranean in France. In Britain, these are places that are notorious for buggery. It's also significant that he names London. The infection has made it home in the story that he's telling. So in this confession, Taylor suggested that the fears were true. Officers with a taste for buggery had a lot of opportunities to indulge it with like-minded peers. He actually offered to reveal the identities of famous British sodomites. He's referencing them in the quote up top here, but his jailers didn't let him. They stop him before he can name any names. Buggery scandals often threaten to draw in powerful men and investigators sometimes work to stop that from happening. As in this case, they didn't want the scandal to spread any further. And in fact, we find that in a lot of other buggery scandals in the 18th and 19th centuries. Taylor's allegations wouldn't have surprised audiences at the time, though. Many suspected that powerful men did exactly this, and there were tons of rumors and scandals to support this view. In fact, less than a year after the Taylor scandal, there was another major scandal involving the Duke of Cumberland. Duke of Cumberland was the fifth son of George III and the future King of Hanover. 
He gets into his own buggery scandal that involves the murder of one of his valets and all sorts of charges of indecent and unnatural behavior. So there are often rumors that this goes all the way to the royal court. That's one of the cases that suggests that maybe it does. Now, queer circles and communities had operated in hiding and even sometimes out in the open for a long time at this point. People knew about this, and there was a history of the public recognizing it. Taylor's was one of a string of scandals showing that Navy men took part, and even in some cases that naval vessels could harbor their own little same-sex communities. There have been several recent scandals like that involving groups of men on a single ship. So you'd have a single ship where it was not just uh, a pair of sailors who got in trouble, but in fact groups of them. Just six years after Taylor was put to death, there was a major scandal of this sort on a ship, the HMS African. In that case, more than two dozen sailors were accused of being part of a same-sex subculture, mostly working class men and boys, but it was clear from the investigation and even from a couple of the people who were indicted that officers on that ship were involved as well. Some junior officers uh, were put on trial and in fact convicted for their involvement. Further, Taylor's scandal showed that these groups were self-aware and self-conscious, that they identified themselves as special sorts of men, and they took part in an intellectual tradition defending and justifying what they did. This is really fascinating. Let's spend a little time on it. I love the language in this and uh, the kind of logic of these arguments. So Taylor told the authorities that he had believed his appetites were natural and inborn. And the quote up here, the way that it's put, is implanted in our nature and constitution. Before his conversion, he had believed in his own version of the Christian God. So his conversion is from a uh, certain certain uh, idiosyncratic stripe of Christianity to uh, something uh, something more regular, uh, at least in the eyes of the authorities. And he had felt that that God wouldn't judge him for his actions if his desire was implanted in that way, if it was something God-given or natural. In the queer circles he'd frequented, the ones that he referenced in his confession, same-sex acts were not considered criminal. He had believed that, and this is another quote that I really love from this, the second one here, he had a right to do with himself as he pleased. We should note, of course, that these are arguments that still have currency today, right? Uh, naturalization arguments are still very popular as a basis for queer rights. This idea that desire or gender identity or something else is natural whatever natural is supposed to mean, and that that makes it moral, or that makes it socially acceptable. Now, Taylor's versions of these ideas were clearly influenced, Taylor's version was clearly influenced by Enlightenment philosophy. Remember, he was reading suspicious stuff like Voltaire. We could also see these beliefs as fitting into the English tradition of liberal individualism and personal autonomy, but this was certainly further than most liberal thinkers in Britain were willing to go at this point, at least publicly. We have some interesting stirrings at this time. For instance, the philosopher Jeremy Bentham wrote, I've got a picture of him here, wrote a treatise arguing for the decriminalization of sex between men around the same time, but he never published it. He did not put it out. These sorts of ideas were circulating at this time, considerably earlier than we tend to date the emergence of queer rights thinking. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Some radical English thinkers were developing ideas very similar to Taylor's. They uh, echo what he was saying in this case. And on the European continent, the Napoleonic Code, Enlightenment legal reforms, and other developments were spreading decriminalization of sodomy widely. So in some places, the legal situation is changing radically. Now, again, we've tended to date these sorts of arguments much later, seeing them as something that first emerged in the 19th century with the emergence of sexology, uh, organized communities of people with same-sex desire, and other developments like that, but there's a much longer history to them. And it wasn't just intellectuals like Jeremy Bentham developing them either. Navy men, among others, had a hand in this process as well. Let me give you an example, a much earlier one that, that I really love. Uh, I'll introduce you to another naval officer who was at the center of a buggery scandal as well. Pictured here, this is Captain Edward Rigby, this wonderful portrait from just around the time that he became one of the most notorious men in Britain. So this is 1698 that I'm bringing you to. We're more than a century before the Taylor scandal. So we're jumping back to a much earlier time. In 1698, a moral reform organization that was active in London targeted Rigby, who was a Navy captain. They sent an agent provocateur to entrap him, to tempt him into a sex act and then arrest him for it. 
the agent that they sent succeeded, he had brought along some backup, essentially some muscle uh, sent by the Moral Reform Organization. He called out a code word. Uh, the code word was Westminster. And his muscle ran into the room and seized Rigby. They brought him before a justice of the peace. Eventually, this goes to trial. And he's found guilty at the Old Bailey. The Old Bailey is London Central Criminal Court. And he's given a harsh punishment, including pillorying, being locked in the stocks on public display. This is a later image, right? This is from the 1760s, so much later than the Rigby case. This is not Rigby himself. This is another man who was put in the pillory. It's supposed to be a depiction of another man who was put in the pillory for a same-sex relationship. So just to illustrate, in general terms, part of Rigby's punishment. The Rigby case was an enormous scandal. This was the talk of London in 1698, and he became infamous for it, and he stays in the press for a couple of decades as a result of later developments, uh, I don't have time to talk you through all of it, but it's an absolutely incredible case. He defects to the French Navy, so he serves the enemy, basically, right? He's captured by the British Navy later, but then he escapes again. And in the end, in the 1720s, so again, a couple decades later, after his buggery scandal, he's executed by the French for financial crimes, it seems, not for any sexual offenses. As I said, I don't have time to go into all the details today, unfortunately, but I have a, I have a dream of writing his biography. So maybe one day I could come back and, uh, and give another talk about him, tell you all the full story, which, which really is incredible. Now this Rigby affair, the 1698 scandal was a huge scandal for many reasons. Some even thought that it led back to queer circles in the Royal Court. So again, we have this Royal Court connection, possibly. Those are the rumors, at least. People love rumors like this. One of the elements that most shocked people about it was that Rigby had supposedly defended his desires to the man sent to entrap him. So the story that this agent told when they went to the Justice of the Peace, when they hauled Rigby before the JP, is that he'd resisted the officer's advances, that Rigby really wanted to sleep with him and he was having none of it. And then Rigby tried to win him over to buggery. So the story is a seduction by debate. Uh, I don't know how plausible that sounds, but that's the story that the agent told at least. So he said that Rigby had argued that sex between men was a wonderful thing, that it was pleasurable, that it was amazing, that it was even better than other options. He said that it was common, that it was socially accepted, and that it was even preferable to sex with women. And he marshaled a whole range of arguments, medical, historical, even religious, to support his claims. Now, in fact, this was so scandalous that the official report uh, that was published on this, and you can see the front page of it here, actually censored portions of it. The religious material in particular is cut out. This was seen as blasphemous. And uh, Rigby himself is accused of blasphemy as part of the trial process here. So this is the front side of this report. This is a lovely copy of it that's at the uh, at the Bodleian Library now. You can find several copies of this in different places. Um, it's, a, it's really an extraordinary document. It is censored, of course, but we can reconstruct the religious portion of it. We're not reliant on just... Um, just the censored printed version, because fortunately the um, original witness statements also survive from the uh, from that meeting with the Justice of the Peace. So if you go to the London Metropolitan Archives, you can look at those and fill in that missing portion of what he supposedly said. Now this Rigby defense is a different sort of defense from Taylor's, right? We're in a really different context here. Taylor's more than a century later. Um, the actual context of the supposed defense where it came out in the process is very different. So there's a lot different between them. But there's clearly something important linking them here. Both of these men were familiar with some sort of underground discourse, presumably the same long running one, that celebrated intimacy between men. We don't usually get to see this, but sometimes when a man was un as unlucky as Rigby or Taylor, that discourse even spilled out into the open. And we can see it, and we can tell that the British public more generally got a chance to see it as well. I'll just note, I'm going to move off of Rigby after this. Uh, so again, wait wait for that biography, which might take me a little while, but uh, get back to it then. But I'll just note as we leave Rigby that I, I particularly love this part of his defense where he points out that famous and celebrated men had same-sex relationships. People believe that widely then. It was a good point for him to make. And this is, a, this is an argument you could still use today, certainly. So Rigby and Taylor both made defenses of intimacy between men, and they both saw those defenses get aired in public. We also know that these arguments found receptive audiences. This is really fascinating, uh, and I'm excited to tell you about it. Ordinary people living in Britain encountered them and took them seriously, these arguments. They even convinced some people. So let me take you back to the Taylor scandal. So we're back to the early 19th century, right? We're jumping up more than a century again. Back to our main guy, James Nehemiah Taylor. 
Taylor was tried and executed in Portsmouth Harbor on the southern coast of England. Now, if we move about 100, uh, 250 miles north up to Yorkshire near Wakefield, we can find a reaction to this case from a 45-year-old tenant farmer named Matthew Tomlinson. Tomlinson read about Taylor in the newspaper. He was a widower, and he was a devout, though pretty idiosyncratic Christian, but definitely a believer. And his surviving diaries reveal a man with a thoughtful and questioning mind, though not a man with any, at least apparently, any special interest in buggery. This is the only place in the surviving journals where he discusses anything, anything that seems queer to us. He doesn't seem to have been of Taylor's persuasion. Nonetheless, the Taylor scandal clearly captured the attention of his social circle, and it must have interested him because he made a very detailed diary entry about it in his diaries on January 14th, 1810. So this is just a couple of weeks after the execution. This entry is absolutely fascinating. Enough time had passed that he, uh, enough time had passed clearly since he had read about Taylor that he didn't remember everything. He mixes up some of the basic biographical details, which is super interesting because he gets a lot else right. The case clearly left a strong impression on him, even if he forgets some of the little details about Taylor. Among other things, he had obviously been impressed by all the praise of Taylor that you found in the newspapers that I talked about a few minutes ago. Remember that we looked at some examples because he called him in the entry, a man of great genius and a ready turn of wit. So he was convinced that Taylor was impressive. It was Taylor's defense of buggery that seems to have most interested the older farmer and his friends. Tomlinson was open to Taylor's arguments. He entertained the idea that same-sex desire was implanted by God or maybe developed naturally or perhaps with some sort of defect in nature. That's the phrase that he uses in this quote from the diary entry. So on that basis, if it's one of those three things, he asks whether it's cruel to punish buggery with death. And that's what the criminal law says should happen, right? Whatever the true explanation for such desire, he concludes in the entry that the death penalty is irrational and cruel. He comes up with another solution. I don't know that you're gonna love the other solution, but let's talk through it a little bit because it's really interesting to see where he gets. So his solution is to reduce the punishment from death to castration. So he gets a lot of the way there. He doesn't make it all the way there. I don't think, uh, I don't think he quite landed on a perfect solution here, but he does think that it should be reduced from the death penalty. He's not supportive of execution for buggery. So he still believed that intimacy between men was immoral, but his logic here is that death is final. It, permanently and totally removes the member from society. It gets rid of the person. Castration, as he sees it, isn't as extreme. It ends the possibility of buggery, and he thinks buggery is bad, so you do need to end it, but it doesn't deprive the community of a member who can still do good, at least what he considers good. So he sees this as a more rational and more humane way to treat men who have sex with other men. All right, uh, a disturbing conclusion, but we can see that he's taking these arguments seriously and he's thinking about them and changing his views as a result of that. And there's some logic to his choice of punishment as well, as ghastly as it seems to us. Castration, of course, has a long history as a punishment for sexual crimes. And in different forms, it's also been used as a response to queer desire, as a way to punish it or remove it. Um, we can think of a lot of examples here. One that always jumps to mind for me is that men such as Alan Turing and others were chemically castrated by the British government as a punishment for similar acts in the 20th century. So it makes sense that Tomlinson would land on castration as well much earlier. Uh, let me just say too, before we move off of this, that my colleague, Dr. Eamon O'Keefe at Cambridge has published on this diary entry. I'm really only summarizing his wonderful research here. He very generously contributed that research and his transcription of the diary entry to my new book, which as I said, I'll talk about at the end. Um, so uh, take a look at that if you want to learn more about his really cool research on this. Now, it turns out that Taylor, the guy at the center of the scandal, and Tomlinson, our tenant farmer here, that they were actually onto something. These arguments that they're making and thinking through anticipated rapid changes that actually were on the horizon. Now, the level of change in Britain is limited. Britain refused to follow its peers on the continent and decriminalize sodomy. That takes much longer. And it would take decades for parliament to change it from a capital crime. So to get rid of the death penalty for uh, penetrative sex between men in particular, 
But the courts did stop hanging men for having sex together in the 1830s. Executions did end in England, and they ended for good. Views were changing, and it seems that the Navy's long run of buggery scandals helped to influence that change, that it was actually important to what took place. Scandals like Rigby's and Taylor's helped introduce these arguments to the wider public. They also showed that public that the men involved were human and maybe even admirable humans, right? Remember Tomlinson, our farmer, he's convinced that Taylor had been an impressive man. The reporting in the papers definitely convinced him there. So at first glance, the James Nehemiah Taylor scandal of 1809 to 1810, it seems to fit old stereotypes about the queer history of the Navy. It's a story about probable abuse, detection, stigma, and punishment. But if we cast a wider net, if we explore the full context and content of the scandal, and if we investigate how the public reacted, we find something much richer and more complex. The queer history of the British Navy is about more than the flogging grade and the gallows. We can also find tolerance, acceptance, pleasure, romance, joy, commitment, a whole range of other things. I hope that the story of this scandal and my own methods of researching it that I've told you in the last few minutes, that it helps show the ways that we can diversify and enrich this history further. Uh, now, the museum has given me an unreasonable amount of time today, uh, and it also has a really, really wonderful image library. So I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes now. I want to give you just a few of my favorite examples of things like that that I found in my own research. The records that we have, what survived, it's limited in a lot of ways, but it does contain many examples of sailors talking about things like finding sexual pleasure together, about affection and romance. So these are just two of my favorite quotes that I found in my research. These are both supposed to be things that lower deck sailors, working class men, ordinary sailors, that they said to other men that they sailed with, to their lovers, presumably. So in this first one, one man talks frankly to his partner about who's better in bed. In the second one, a sailor supposedly told his hammock mate, uh, when I said bed before, bed is a uh, metaphorical, of course, uh, uh, hammocks, uh, working class sailors are sleeping in hammocks. So in the second one, he tells his hammock mate that he is his dear, his life, his soul. Uh, I'm a weird sort of person. I collect old sex jokes and boasts. I think they are some of the most incredible things we can find from the past. And this is my favorite one I've ever found. So I'm very excited to share it with you. This is supposed to be a quote from an Italian cook who was serving in the British Navy, and he supposedly bragged to another sailor about his seduction technique. He said, the best way to serve an Englishman is to give him cake and to, uh, and it occurred to me right before we started here that I didn't ask if it was okay for me to curse, but in fact, the original court documents censored it as well. If you look back, if you look at the bottom line of the uh, manuscript here, you can see that the scribe wasn't willing to write out the word either. So I'll leave it to you to fill in what he might've said here. Um, insert your own uh, salty sailor expression. Intimacy took all sorts of forms. None of these images is sexual, certainly not explicitly sexual, but they're all And this isn't just Bray either. Uh, I just particularly like the Bray images. Lots of other visual artists give us depictions of male intimacy as well, such as this Cruikshank one. to consider these forms of intimacy as well. And there are historians and other scholars doing all sorts of cool things with things like sea shanties and other, other amazing sources. And we see lots of different male forms and masculine pursuits in visual and other art forms from this period. I really like this image because it's a reminder first that women were often aboard on these ships, including as sex workers. And also that ships were really diverse places in many different ways. They were far more diverse than most British communities at this time. They included men from all around the British Isles and all around the world, in fact. Sailors who spoke different languages, who worshiped different faiths, and people that had all sorts of different bodies and different and sometimes changing gender identities as well. And so in the last few minutes, I wanna focus on that last piece. I haven't talked about this dimension of this history as much yet today, so I want to tell you one last quick story from a naval buggery scandal, and then, then I will let you go. We can go to the Q&A. So just two years before the Taylor affair, so we're in 1807 here, just two years earlier, there had been a very similar scandal. This was a case involving a Navy lieutenant named William Berry. Berry was executed for a very similar crime. 
This had been an even larger scandal. Barry is a higher ranking officer, right? He's a commissioned officer. He in fact ended up being one of the highest ranking men ever executed by the Navy for buggery. At his trial in 1807, several witnesses testified against him, <clears throat> including one surprising figure. This was a sailor that the newspapers took to calling the little female tar. Tar was a common term for sailor at this time. Um, so this is, uh, this, is, um, this is slang that would have been well known. At the time of the trial, the little female tar went by Elizabeth Bowden, which was apparently their birth name. But Bowden had served the greater part of a year in the Navy as John Bowden, ship's boy third class. Now, Bowden still needs a historian because we don't know the whole story here. We'll probably never know the whole story, figure that all out. But I know that there's more to discover in the archives. There's more to, more to tell here. I'll just observe a few things in the couple of minutes we have left right now. When the naval authorities discovered Bowden's birth gender, they did make the young sailor live under it. So the person who had been living as John Bowden had to live as Elizabeth Bowden. But I've never found any evidence in the archival record or any of the reporting on this of any stigma or punishment for transing gender. In fact, fascinatingly, Bowden was allowed to testify in court and ended up becoming the major witness that the prosecution had against Barry, against the officer here, even though everyone involved seems to have understood what happened with Bowden's gender as deception on Bowden's part. So this is coded for them as Bowden actually being a girl. You can see in the bottom document here that Elizabeth Bowden is identified as a girl and that uh, living as John Bowden is, is, is Bowden deceiving them in some way. But they still let Bowden be a witness and Bowden becomes the star witness in fact, and is discussed widely in the newspapers, as you can see from this example on the top right. Again, in the published stuff, in the newspapers, there's no stigma in the reporting. Instead, Bowden's participation is discussed as a sort of intriguing wrinkle to the case. The papers pay, and this example shows this too, particular attention to Bowden's dress, which they clearly read as cross-dressing. So you can see the report here at the bottom says that Bowden appeared in a long jacket and blue trousers. This is typical male sailor's attire, a detail that clearly really interested them. Stories of people taking new genders, new gender identities at sea were very popular at this time in fiction and in supposedly true tales like this one. And you've, uh, I'm sure, all seen stories about uh, people doing this at sea, something we find in things like the, Pirate of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Uh, these remain really popular. Scholars have documented many real cases of this sort, including this one. This is a real case. What exactly happened isn't clear, but there was something going on here on the hazard, on HMS Hazard, the ship where this all originated. Historians such as Jen Mannion in a wonderful book <clears throat> called Female Husbands uh, have argued that we should consider people such as Bowden as part of trans history. And I agree with that. So scandals like this one then, the William Berry scandal of 1807, <clears throat> also showed the public that the Navy was a truly diverse place. Take any given sailor who knew what their desires were, their sexual history, maybe their gender journey. These scandals also reveal that Navy men themselves knew that their community was diverse. One of the reasons I wanted to tell you about this scandal and about Bowdoin is that it's echoed in the James Nehemiah Taylor scandal in a little detail there. So remember the Taylor scandal is the major one that we're considering today from 1809, just a couple of years later, our surgeon who was put to death. During the Taylor trial, the court had questioned witnesses about whether the ship's boy who was involved, remember Thomas Ashton, he's the one who escaped from the Jamaica and didn't end up going on trial. they had asked whether Thomas Ashton was male or female. So the officers who made up that court had no illusions. They knew that the Navy was big and that it was filled with sailors of all sorts of genders, sexual proclivities, who knew what else, uh, all sorts of diversity. The little female tar who had appeared in court just a couple of years earlier, for them, wasn't some strange anomaly. There might be others like Bowden on any given ship. Maybe Taylor, uh, maybe Ashton, the boy in the Taylor case, was like Bowden as well. They were aware of this diversity, and we need to remember this diversity as well when we think about this time period. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you all for coming and listening to me today. I hope that you've learned something about the queer history of the British Navy. I'll say just quickly that most of the sources that I used for this come from my brand new primary source collection, which is out from Rutledge. Tomorrow is publication day, so I'm very excited for that. This has been a long time coming. Um, if you're feeling generous, definitely consider buying this. Unfortunately, though, it is uh, priced for academic libraries. That's an unfortunate feature of academic publishing now. 
the ebook did come out to be cheaper than I feared, but it's still pretty expensive. So if you're at a place with an academic library, maybe suggest it to an acquisitions librarian, fill out the form if, uh, if you want to help me out a little bit. But otherwise, I wouldn't recommend paying for it necessarily, but I am going to be getting a lot of author's copies of the PDF, and I'd be very, very happy to give you one, especially if you want to use it for your own research or for teaching. Um, I designed it for researchers and teachers with them in mind, um, and I think it'll be helpful and very interesting to you if you care about this history. So please get in touch with me if, uh, if you'd like to learn more about it or get a copy. You can contact me through my website, and the URL is down at the bottom. And with that, uh, I'll just thank you all for coming today. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I'm very excited for the Q&A. Thank you.